Hi, everybody. I'm Ryan. And I'm Katie. And you're listening to The List, where we continue our top 100 countdown of the greatest films of all time to let you know whether they are truly worth watching, whether they're bucket list worthy or not. And today we're watching Rain Man from 1988, starring Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise and Valeria Galino. Definitely, so, definitely a good movie. Definitely, definitely good. Definitely. Uh, for, so for those of you who haven't seen it, I'll give you a little synopsis. So fast-talking salesman Charlie Babbitt, played by Tom Cruise, receives a phone call that his estranged father has died leaving his multi-million dollar estate to an unknown benefactor and leaving Charlie with only a classic car and his father's prized rose bushes. A slighted Charlie embarks on a journey with his girlfriend, Susanna, to find this benefactor, only, discover that, only to discover that he has an older brother, Raymond, an autistic savant who has been hidden from him for more than 20 years. Charlie kidnaps Raymond from his long-term care facility and together they, be they begin a time-sensitive cross-country trip to try and save Charlie's floundering business. I have a couple facts about this Let's movie. Let's hear them. Are they fun and, facts or just facts? Uh, they're kind of fun. Love it. Some Let's of them. them. So number one, the character Raymond is based on a real-life person. Well, really two real-life people. A real life savant by the name of Ken Peak, and also the writer based this person off of a, a real life friend, Bill Sackler. Number two is we've actually seen Kim Peak in real life. Yes, that is a fun fact. So I didn't get to talk to him, but I got to see what he was doing because I was actually working at a library at the time where he made a little appearance. And um, so I got to see some of the stuff he did. He was doing for the crowd there, but I didn't get to actually interact with him. Did you get to talk to him? I was there too. Were we together at that point? We had to mm, have been. Maybe. But I, yeah, so I, I was in the library. I do remember him giving his speech that he did. He just kind of walked around the room and talked. But so yeah. I don't remember him. I don't remember him talking. You may not have been it, there. It was there's a really large group of people there for a tiny little South Georgia college, community college. Yeah, I remember him him saying like asking people what their name was and their birthday and he would like tell them what day of the week that they were born on and like the top headline in yeah, the news. Yeah, I remember for that. that day. So I remember, I remember him that doing too. that. And I remember him getting a random book and he was reading two pages, one with each eye, with perfect retention yeah. of everything that he read. It was, and he did it in like a few seconds. It was crazy. It was, I do remember it being crazy. I remember being extremely impressed. So, um, you know, that's the character of Raymond um, based off, off, of, off of him, really. Yeah. And then my third fact is... Barry Morrow, one of the writers, um, actually gave his Oscar to Kim Peek to carry with him at his oh, appearances. That's awesome. And it's been referred to as the most love Oscar statue of all time because so many people have handled it yeah. compared to the other ones. I also had a couple of facts, some Let's fun, some a little bit boring. So why am I sharing them with you? I don't know, but you decide which ones are fun and which ones are boring. Um, a year prior to playing Raymond Hoffman prepared by seeking out and educating himself on autistic people, specifically those with savant syndrome. Yeah. Um, and I saw specifically that he actually um, met Kim peak. He and did. It, yeah. Kind of examined him and mm -hmm. based some of his character off of him. Spent personally. a lot of time with them and decided to like take some of his, um, some of the things that he did, his mannerisms, and like he toned him down a little bit, he said. Um, but interestingly enough, even though he spent a year preparing for this, he wanted out three weeks in. <laughs> and he said, get Dreyfus, get somebody else, because this is the worst work of my life. Like he was not happy with the work he was doing. Not really? happy with yeah, not happy with his acting, not happy with how he was portraying the character. And he was like, I want out, I'm done. 
thankfully he finished because I think he did a lovely job. But uh, he did amazing. Yeah. I I thought you were gonna say he he wanted to stop just because to play that character was so difficult. I imagine. And it's not that he thought the work was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dustin Hoffman and Tom Cruise named the movie two schmucks in a car. So while they were like (laughs) driving around filming this road trip movie, that's what they would call it behind the scenes. That's funny. (laughs) Yeah. This was Hans Zimmer's first score for a Hollywood production, which I did not know. I didn't know that. I think it's like Hans and I said Hans, but that's the Southern in me. So. Which is interesting. I, I don't notice the score in a lot of movies. Um, I think that a good score is there and emotionally, I don't want to say emotionally manipulate you, but it does. But it also doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. It kind of is just like breathing or your heartbeat. It's essential, but you don't always notice it. Um, but the the few times I did notice in this movie, I did think it was outstanding. Yeah, I agree. Um, if, if it if it fits seamlessly into the background and kind of enhances the mood or whatever, I, and you don't notice it, it's that's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Um, Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro, and Mel Gibson all turned down this role. So some star studded people there who were considered. And another interesting fact about this movie is that it had four directors. <laughs> it started off with Martin Bress, who left because of Hoffman. They did not work well together. And he skedaddled after a couple of weeks. Steven Spielberg was signed on for the movie and agreed to do it and did a lot of preparation and then left for Indiana Jones. And really? Sid- yeah, he okay. did. Uh huh. And Sidney Pollock left after a couple of weeks and then Barry Levinson ended up directing and finishing the movie. I think only the last one, Barry Levinson's name was on the, on the yeah. credit though. Yes. That's so I don't, weird. I don't know how much work these directors got to put in on the movie, but they were at one point a part of the movie, but like with Steven Spielberg, he never was on set and like, directing anything he just did a he just agreed to do it signed on did a ton of preparation and then was like peace i'm going to film indiana jones <laughs> that's strange so yeah and my last what i said i didn't see that anywhere in my prep work this is my last fact and it is a fun one during casino scenes hoffman would leave to play blackjack And at one point he completely disappeared and they had everybody looking for him. And so they assigned someone whose like sole job it was, was to keep him from wandering off to play blackjack. (laughs) (laughs) Imagine putting on your resume. Did he go off and play as the character ran? No, he just was playing blackjack. (laughs) That's funny. (laughs) So imagine you put on your resume babysitter for Dustin Hoffman. (laughs) (laughs) All right. That's funny. Those are all my facts. So this movie did receive four Academy Awards, one for Best Picture, one for Best Actor, which went to Dustin Hoffman, one to the director, and one for the writing. So they did receive four Academy Awards, four Oscars for this for this movie. All of which very well deserved in my I opinion. think so too. I agree. Um, overall, I really I I really thought this movie had a great story. Um I think any time that you have a story about a huge jerk in the beginning and by the end, you, even if you're not necessarily rooting for them, you understand them more and you care about them more. That's good writing. And I thought that the way that you get to the end with an unlikable character is that you start off with a good hooky story. And the story had a nice hook about this sleazy car salesman who got slighted his inheritance and found out that he had this brother he knew nothing about his entire life you want to hear what happens in that story and that gives them time to develop the characters very very well which they did they didn't drop the ball you you eventually fall in love with both brothers and want to see what happens to them and and how their story turns out i thought it was a great story big picture wise and it was a great story character wise and i would give it a nine yeah um It's a great story. I love it. Just to piggyback on what you said, the relationship 
between Charlie and Raymond is fantastic. At the heart of this story, I think it's about two brothers getting to know each other. I think in a way, Raymond's not the only one who is not able to express himself emotionally. There's some hints in the very beginning of the film that Charlie's just this angry person. He never shares any information about his life with his girlfriend. And in a way he's emotionally autistic as well. And it's really interesting that two people who cannot express emotion appropriately end up bonding together and having a relationship together. And so I think they did that beautifully. I think also you can really see the progression, especially of, of Charlie's character from this really jerk. Who's really only out for himself learning and going through this journey and changing. And so I thought that was done really well also. So it's way up there for me. I, I think 9.8. This is a this is a great film. I really liked all the characters. And it was just done. It just tied up so nicely at the end. Right? From beginning to end. I agree. And I think it, it Not that I'm off- saying it, it ended well or not ended well. I just think that the progression of the story from beginning to end was was tied up so nicely. And it made sense. And I think it was interesting how it turned from a story where a man felt like he was slighted his inheritance into a story where a man felt like he was slighted his his family, his blood, a relationship yes. that he can never, ever get back. Like they can do their best now. But what about all those years where he thought it was just him, where he could have loved his brother and, and developed a bond with him and maybe both of their lives would have turned out differently Uh, I don't care what anybody says by the end of that movie, Raymond and Charlie had a bond and Raymond, Raymond loved his brother in his own way. This main man, he became instead of, you know, in the beginning, he was saying his main man, Vern, who was one of his caretakers at the main man, Charlie, Yeah, his main man, Charlie, his main man, Charlie. And then, yeah, it's, it's great. It's a, it's a really good story. And, to watch to watch Charlie's character go from somebody who only cared about himself in the world and then only cared about the money into somebody who and, and it wasn't the kind of change that makes you go, this is unrealistic. Nobody who is this disgusting in the beginning is going to be a saint by the end. And he wasn't, but he was changed enough that it was realistic and made you believe that he would have continued to change and and would continue to grow. And had finally, in his own way, begun to care about somebody besides himself. His selfish ways were still there, but he was making room for someone else in his life, which he had not done before. Yeah, and I think they did it really well to make it not so much that he was just this complete jerk, but like he, I mean, he he was kind of a jerk, but also he really had no understanding of the condition that his brother was going through. Yeah. Uh, And so that on top of that made it more believable that he, as he went through time with him, that he realized, Oh, you know, these are things that he can't help. And also I'm, (laughs) I'm a lot of the problem as well. And so he has that inner, inner uh, reflection and and change throughout the story. So, which for somebody like Charlie, that's really hard to admit that Mm -hmm. you're the problem in anything. Um, I do wish we would have seen more of Raymond functioning on his own. I know that the scene where Raymond is cooking and sets off the fire alarm is meant to like show us he can't really function on his own, but I don't believe that. I don't think he had been given enough of an opportunity and I wish we would have seen more of him outside of the institution and outside of depending directly on Charlie for everything. I just wish we would have had a little bit more of that, but I I disagree. He's not capable of doing anything. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. That's a hundred percent true. Hmm. Hundred percent true. Not able to do anything. He's completely unaware of the world around him. And they show you that in the cinematography. We'll jump to that right now. Yeah, let's do that. To illustrate my point. 
Okay, they show me, you that in the you. in the cinematography because you at the beginning of the movie you start to see thing you see things mostly through Charlie's eyes. Right. Human relationships, you know, the back and forth, caring about money, and then, you know, and success and his relationship with Susanna. And then towards the middle of the film, as they're going on this journey, it switches almost. There's a, there's a point where it switches where you see th the world through Raymond's eyes. Yeah. And instead of like paying attention to his brother or anything else, he's, you know, he's looking out into the distance and you, and you can tell by the way the camera is shot that he's counting lines on the road. He's counting, um, I don't know, the, the little bars on the, um, the, the rails, power lines, just all these weird things that people without autism would not notice, but that he notices and thinks are significant and important that he pays attention to. And so I think that's another way to, to put you in, in his mindset that his mind does not work like, like Charlie's and the things that he's focused on take him out of, of this world. Yeah. I hear what so you're saying. I yeah. don't think he, I know he's not capable from what they showed him of, of doing much of anything on his own without, yeah. without getting hurt. I agree with that. He I got don't lost. Think he got I, almost burned the house down. Um, yeah. He has his routines that he cannot miss without injuring himself. Right. Put him right. in severe emotional distress. It, all classic things with people with severe autism do. And I, I think it's portrayed perfectly from a medical standpoint. Yeah. And I hear you about the cinematography. I do remember the exact moment you're talking about because it was significant to me too. I think it's when they were on the bridge. Uh, Charlie had had, or Raymond had had a meltdown in the airport and basically was not going to get on a plane. And so Charlie has to rent a car and they start driving to LA and they hit over a bridge and you can hear and feel what Raymond is hearing and feeling. And it puts you almost into a trance and there's nothing else outside of the way that the tires are hitting the bridge and the way that the beams are flying by on the bridge. Yeah. And it does it in other places too. Like when they yes. get va in Vegas, all mm -hmm. the gl the glitter and the noises yeah. and the, the calculations, I mean, you can see all of that visually and that's yeah. what's passing through his, his brain as significant. That's all right. he's paying attention to. And I do. And think so I thought that, that was done really nicely. Yeah. And the cinematography was nice. Uh, like it was a twofold kind of genius the, that it, in that just portraying a, a road trip is kind of difficult. And I thought they did a really good job of that. And mm -hmm. secondly, what you're talking about where you got to see things and feel things through Raymond's eyes without it being um, super overt or heavy handed. It was really well done. I, I felt overstimulated sometimes with the light and the noise and um, they did a good job of making you feel anxiety or making you grounded in Raymond's point of view or Charlie's point of view through the cinematography. I thought it was very clever and I would give it an eight. Yeah. I think 8.5 for me. Yeah. What about the acting? The acting. I, I know that Tom Cruise and Dustin Hoffman, there's nothing groundbreaking about me saying that these are extraordinary actors. I'd seen them both in other things and I had an appreciation for both of them. But after this movie, it is so elevated. It's like I found a new appreciation for both of them. The The focus of this is, of course, going to be on Dustin. He's not that kid from The Graduate anymore. No, right? <laughs> he's not. And is it that so interesting with Dustin Hoffman that I've now seen him in three movies and in each of those movies, he's been a distinct and different character. Oh, he's an amazing and character actor. He really I is. I think that had you asked me before we started this podcast, I Dustin Hoffman wouldn't have come to my mind as one of my favorite actors, but now I think he's my favorite actor. He's, he's really incredible. Good. I mean, he's not a bad one to have as a favorite. No. So. And when you talk about, and he knows how to choose his movies because he does. They're so all... far he has been in at least, you know, in major roles, he's been at, in at least three movies Two. that we've yeah. watched. So, so far we haven't talked about the, the third one but that's coming up right. soon, but he's also had minor appearances in like in two other others. of the, yeah. 
of them. So like that's five out of the top 100 films of all time that right. he's been in. And I think talking about this movie, you're going to want to focus on Dustin Hoffman because he did such an extraordinary job of capturing Raymond's character. But Tom Cruise did just as great of a job to me in capturing this bold, rotten brat that you want to punch in the beginning to somebody that by the end you you like, understand. understand. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, I get it. I get you, Charlie. And I kind of want you to be happy. And I think that's such a difficult thing. You can portray somebody that not that Raymond did this or Dustin Hoffman did this, but in movies, you can portray somebody that's beloved or easy to love and be like, oh, they did a great job. It's a lot harder to play somebody with nuance who, you know, is maybe not fully black and why like they're not fully good or bad. And I think Tom Cruise is another person that I've have a newfound respect for after this movie. This movie is a 10 out of 10 for me when it comes to acting. I find no fault with any of the actors and I am and in awe of their performance. Let me just say this. She does not have that big of a role, but Valeria Golina, yeah. I love her. She's the tenderness fantastic. she showed towards Raymond, the She's fire. She's in one of my other, other favorite movies that you can never find anymore. It's called Blank Slate with Dana Carvey. She's the main actress. In I've it. never and, seen uh, that. She's in a lot of the uh, Hot Shot movies and stuff like that, a lot of comedies. Yeah. She's, she's wonderful in this. Uh, all, all, you know, 10 star acting. Yeah. Uh, for me, for all of them, but especially Dustin Hoffman, he gets his study and his portrayal of a person with, with autism is spot on, spot on. I'm, I'm honestly, I, I, I bet you mentally to get into that space. It's so difficult, but you're right. Even Tom Cruise, I think he may have had the more difficult role because he had to play off of that. And he yeah. doesn't have a lot to play off of because, you know, Raymond doesn't show a lot of, or uh, Raymond doesn't show a lot of emotion, right? right? Unless something really severe is going on. So just incredible. Uh, 10 and the out way 10, Tom Cruise acting. was able to, to have these moments of, just losing his mind and having to temper it back down because he's this spoiled, rotten, only child in his mind. And mm -hmm. he's lived his life like that, not ever caring about anyone. And then comes not just a brother, but a brother who he doesn't know how to communicate with and doesn't understand. So he has these moments where he just wants to lose his mind. And then he has to portray somebody who's trying to find the patience and the ability to control his emotions and his self around his brother. And I, I just thought it was magnificent. It was wonderful. Okay. What's the wow factor in this movie? The wow factor in this movie for me is the portrayal of the love between two brothers who don't know how to love they don't know how to love traditionally and how love can transcend whatever barriers there are. And you can find a way, like, I just thought it was a beautiful portrayal of not typical relating to the unrelatable. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I thought it was wonderful. And uh, yeah, that's my wow factor here, and I'm going to give it a nine. I'm dead. Uh, I'm uh, I'm dittoing you on that one, 100. percent That's the wow factor for me. Mm, I I almost want to say it's a ten. I, I'm going to say nine point eight. It's a nine point yeah. eight for me. You can say it's a ten if you want. I so is this you. a top 100 film of all time? Yes. What do you think? I, I agree, 100. percent Yes. Is this a bucket list movie? I don't know. I don't know if this is a bucket list movie. Really? Hmm. Interesting. This is a bucket list movie for me. It's one of those desert island movies. Like if, if there's one I wanted to watch over and over again, it, this would be one of them I'd want to take with me. This is really hard for me. 
I don't know if this is a bucket list movie or not. Mm. But I have to give an answer. Oof. I'm going to say, yes, this is a bucket list movie. I don't know why I'm torn. I don't know why I. it's so hard for me to say yes. I feel like it's a great movie. I feel like it deserved every accolade it got. I feel okay with my decision to say it's a bucket list movie. I do. I, I think it is a bucket list movie. I just think it's maybe just barely there for me. I mean, maybe maybe some of the other movies that we watched that were bucket list that's movies what's hard for me. are are probably more emotionally impactful. Yes, um, but just that's for, what's difficult but to me. This I put one, it. this one is this one's emotionally impactful to it me is. though too. Like it's not. Like I'm not sobbing, I'm not laughing hysterically, but it it makes you feel it makes you feel good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it makes you think about connection with others, and I like that. And and yeah. for me, I I think that pushes it up along with the acting and and yeah. all the little elements. They're there for me. So I yeah. think this is a this is a a great great film. I think it's a bucket list movie. I um you know if it's you know is is it my number one bucket list movie? I probably wouldn't say that, but I think it's I think it's way up there. So I, I think, think it's definitely well worth your time to watch it. I think we're at the point now where it's hard for me to look back at some of them and think like The Green Mile and Goodwill Hunting were such firm bucket list movies for me. That see, now when we watch, I'm like. See, for me, these these this movie is up there with those movies for me. Not for me. It's not there. They're, they're up there for me. Yeah. And, um, and I think it deserves to be there. Who um, is this movie not for? There's a lot of profanity. Um, there's on-screen intimacy. I would say don't watch this with your kids. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> otherwise I don't think it's, there's anybody it's not for other than that. So okay. what do you think? No, I, I agree. Yeah. I think you're right. Let's rank it. Let's show, okay. show our screens. Um, I'll go first. All right. So at the moment I have green miles, number one, double indemnity as two and number three, I have network. I think, Ooh, Pulp Fiction is going to fall off today and I'm bringing, this one's going to go way up for me. Above uh, Goodwill Hunting? Uh, yeah, for me, it's... it's. Wow. I enjoy this movie much better than Goodwill Hunting. I'm surprised it's this high for you. Um, Are you I, thinking I, about putting it number two? And I'm just really struggling um, between Double Indemnity and Rain Man. They're so close. Um I think I'm going to keep Raymond at three and um, keep double indemnity at number two. I'm I, shocked. I, I, this is a, this is a great, great movie. I'm really shocked. I have the green mile. Number one, goodwill hunting. Number two, um, giant third man, double indemnity, close encounters, pulp fiction network. Why is network there? Did I have Network there? I network, Wuthering Heights, <laughs> and Rebel Without a Cause. Rebel Without a Cause I, is down at 10 for you? It, we, had this, we have this discussion every time why I Rebel know. Without a Cause is down there. But, yeah, I don't want it to go. This is painful. Rebel Without a Cause was a very good movie. Yeah, that's that's a painful one to that, remove. That really hurt. That really hurt. Um, I... I am going to say it's probably, I know that I like it better than Close Encounters. I think I like it less than Double Indemnity. So that's where it's going to go. It's going to go at number six for me. Um, I'm honestly kind of surprised it's that high on my list. I'm, I'm surprised it's that low. You like, Giant Are you? Better, you like Giant better than this movie? Giant was such a beautiful romance to me. The, the way that they portrayed love throughout the ages and a healthy 
love between people I when they're younger. Romance movies are going to win with you anytime. They are, and, anyway. and not only are romance movies going to win with me, but a movie about this a is marriage, a romance movie. Come on, a movie about a marriage that lasts throughout the ages, and you get to see them grow old together, and you get to see a complicated dynamic. That's always going to be like Chef's Kiss to me. Um, but bromance movies work for me too. I love seeing love between like. I, any kind of platonic love between men is not shown enough in film to me. I think men deserve to see that too. And so I like any kind of bromance movie or strong male friendships are really nice to me too. So uh, it's up there, but I'm surprised it went as far as it did. Okay. I have a, a little spoiler I want to ask you about. So okay. if you have not seen Rain Man and plan on watching it, now's the time to stop. And now is also the time warning, to follow warning. us on Instagram, Ryan and Kat's list. <laughs> See you there. Now, warning, warning, <laughs> spoilers. Uh, so at the end, when Raymond is going back to Westbrook and Charlie is staying in California and he says, I'll see you next week. You think he's, do you think he goes to see him? Oh, don't say that. I hope so. I really hope so. Why do you doubt that? I don't know. That makes me sad. I think he goes back to see him for sure. You think he goes back that week though? Can I tell you what I, I don't understand is why not just move back to be by your brother? You have realized that you have family you never knew about. You love your brother. Your business is kind of skeevy anyway. Is it really not worth it to to skeevy? I don't he know like imports Lamborghinis and uh, bypasses EPA laws. And well, his 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 fiance's there. She his would job move with is him. There. She would have. He moved doesn't with really him. need him all the time because he is there at Westbrook. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't. I, I feel like that would be out of character for him to to move there. But I. I think he does go back. I, I don't think he, he would tell him, especially with, you know, the strict regimen that mm -mm. Um, he needs. Yeah. That he would be there in a, in a week. If he if wasn't, he wasn't gonna really going to be there. I agree. He's probably like Raymond's coming on Wednesday. Raymond I, or I Charlie will be here on Wednesday. Believe, Charlie will be here on Wednesday. Yeah. I a hundred percent believe that they continue their relationship. Yeah. I was wondering. Because they kind of leave it ambiguous that you don't yeah, really know. Right. So. I wish you would have moved closer. I wish I would have had that emotional resolution of knowing they were going to continue their relationship because it's so easy. Well, to, he doesn't to, have to do a week long road trip now. He can fly. Yeah. So. I just feel like it's so easy when there's distance to be like, oh, well, you know, next month or in a couple of months or in a few weeks, I'll see you. And then it's been years. I don't want that to happen with Charlie and Raymond. I want it's, them to have each other. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that was the only spoiler I had. Do you have anything? No, I'm just mad at you for asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, we won't have an episode because we will be out of town. However, the following week, we will be going over episode or I guess film number 72. Mr. Smith goes to Washington starring James Stewart. So tune in. Thanks for listening. We look forward to hear your comments. Let us know what you thought about Rain Man. We thought it was definitely, definitely good. Peace out. I'm Ryan. I'm Katie. Bye.